what the security market line does is it gives us the security's expected return for a given level of risk. Some of those sources of risk include liquidity risk, financial risk, business risk, contract risk, and exchange rate risk. Now, all of these different types of risks can be thought of as beta. And what beta measures is the uh, covariance of the individual in security uh, compared to that of the market and then divided by the uh, standard deviation squared of the market. So uh, risk or beta is one component of the security market line. Now the other component of the security market line is known as expected return. And expected return, uh, we think of uh, capital. Now I have a U.S. capital here. And we think of investors needing a expected return on their capital. Uh, and we could branch this out into a couple different segments. Our, our first segment can be low risk, where the investor's uh, not taking a lot of risk. They want to get their capital back, but they would like uh, some type of return on their capital. The next category is average risk, where an investor is taking average risk and they expect to get an average return, uh, depending on where the security market line is at. And then finally we have high risk, where the investor is taking a lot of risk and they're hoping for a huge payoff in response to that uh, amount of risk. And again, once again, the risk is measured by beta. Now we can graph this uh, security market line here, and uh, we'll call it just SML for short. Now if you'll notice it intersects at the uh, risk-free rate, or RFR, that is considered uh, the risk-free rate of return. Now if we take a look closer look at the uh, SML in front of us, there's uh, three different ways it can be altered. Uh, the first way is simply uh, how the security uh, changes or the security uh, risk changes. For example, we have uh, XYZ stock. Well, uh, over time, XYZ stock could become riskier or it could become less risky, uh, depending on volatility, uh, business risk, or other factors we've talked about earlier. The uh, second factor that uh, mainly changes the slope of risk can be thought of as investors' perception or attitude uh, toward risk. And what I mean by that is uh, what it does is it changes the slope of the SML. Uh, take, for example, we have one extreme in 2005 where investors were bidding up uh, prices of securities and conversely that drove the expected return or expected yield down of those securities and so we had a, a slope that looked something like this now on the opposite of the spectrum we can think uh, fast forward to 2008 when investors had to unwind all these liquid illiquid positions and uh, just dump securities to, to meet margin calls where uh, none of the banks wanted or most of the banks didn't want to take any uh, risk and uh, investors who did take risk demanded a really high uh, premium uh, for the, the risk being taken. The third way the SML can change is an upward or uh, downward uh, parallel movement in the, the line of the SML. And what I mean by this is there's two different ways. There's inflation and there is the uh, risk-free rate of return. So let's say, for example, inflation goes down, the SML would go down in a parallel fashion. Now, if inflation goes up, the SML would go up in a parallel flash fashion. Now, for the risk-free rate, if uh, interest rates are cut, uh, the SML would go down in a parallel movement. And if interest rates are rising, the SML would increase because uh, investors require a, a higher rate of return. Now let's move back to the intersect point here, or the RFR, that's the risk-free rate of return. That's the, the point where the SML uh, slope intersects. And uh, this line I'm drawing right here can be thought of as uh, where the beta at one, or the market uh, beta intersects at. And we can uh, draw an intersection here, uh, and we'll write this as E 
RM, which is basically the expected return of the market portfolio. And if you look closer, this difference uh, right here uh, that I highlighted in yellow is going to be basically the expected return of the market portfolio minus the risk-free rate. And what that does is that gives us beta. Now, uh, beta can actually be negative, where the expected return is uh, lower than that of uh, the expected return of a uh, risk-free uh, security. And uh, let's move back to uh, what beta is and how to calculate it here. So we got expected return uh, of the market minus the risk-free rate of return. That is going to equal our beta. Now let's do an example of how this would work. Okay, let's say uh, in this example, let's say this expected return of the market is about 6%. Okay, that's our expected return. And we're going to subtract the risk-free rate and we're going to say it's about 3%. So 6% minus 3% is going to equal uh, 3%. So in that case, or this case, uh, is this example right here, our uh, beta would be uh, 3%. So let's say we have XYZ security, or XYZ stock, and that stock has a beta of 2. Well, we want to figure out what the expected rate of return for that uh, stock is. Okay, well, a beta of 2, so it's twice as risky as the market. So we'd set up an equation like this where the return is going to equal uh, the 3% for the risk-free rate. And then we're going to add the beta to that. And uh, the beta is 3% in our example. And since the stock has a beta of 2, we multiply it by 2. So 3% plus 2% uh, times 3%. Well, 2% times 3% is 6%. So 3% plus 6% is going to equal 9%. And in this case, the expected return for XYZ stock is going to be uh, 9% with a beta of 2. Now, if XYZ stock had a beta of 0, it would just equal the uh, risk-free rate, which would be uh, 3%. And conversely, if uh, XYZ stock had a beta of 3, uh, you would increase the expected return uh, to 12% uh, in that case. And uh, that's an example of how the uh, security market line works. Thank you for watching.